welcome to part 2 of building a 2D physics engine. Today I'm going to be talking about the game loop. The game loop is a central loop that gets run on every update frame. And it's something that every game developer should know. It's not something that's really specific to physics, but um, it is something that I, um, I wanted to talk about um, for you know anyone who's watching this who may not have developed games in the past or maybe wants to just brush up on it. And I'll talk about some of the tricks you can do with game loops and how that ties in with your physics engine. But um, a game loop is, is really something that is um, more something that's uh, useful for video games in general. In fact, you don't even have to have physics in your game to warrant having a game loop. You don't even have to have a game. Um, a game loop can be useful for animations. Um, and, uh, and, and you can also have a game that doesn't require a game loop. Um, like, you know, what a game loop does is it updates your game and, uh, and does animations and things like that. But, um, you know, if you suppose that you had something like a tic-tac-toe game, it wouldn't require a game loop. So uh, let's get into it, and I'll show you what the uh, structure of a typical game loop is. This is an illustration of a typical game loop. Typically, it'll start off with getting the user's input from your keyboard or game device, then updating the game, including the physics, and then updating the game's graphics or redrawing. After each cycle, the game loop will sleep for a certain number of milliseconds, depending on the desired frame rate, and then the cycle will start again from the beginning. The reason you would want to get the user input is so that the user can interact with the simulation. That's really what your goal is. And the question is, how does the user interact with the simulation? How do, how do those buttons or key presses or mouse movements um, change the simulation and uh, how do they get translated into forces or accelerations or velocities or changes in position. So for example here was an old game that came out in 1990 called Eye of the Beholder and as you can see the user is clicking around to change their position and they just threw a rock so um, you know the concept of physics is there obviously it's not as um, advanced as some of the more modern games that you would get um, but you know you can still incorporate physics in a game like this but um, when the user is clicking, they're, they're just directly changing their positions. And that was a pretty common style back then. Here's a clip from what I think is possibly one of the best games of all time, Wolfenstein 3D from 1992. And uh, in this game, the user input changes the velocity of the character. So there's no concept of force or acceleration. This is a style that's been used in many games. Here's a game from a decade later, Hunter the Reckoning from 2002, and uh, also the same thing, you're just setting the character's velocity through your input. Those styles are tried and tested, and there are many ways that you can incorporate other game physics in with that. The only problem with those methods of controlling the game is that they don't produce movements that are very realistic. In Super Mario Bros. 3, you don't control the character's position or their velocity, you control their acceleration. And this was really one of the central mechanics of the game that set it apart from other games at the time. So I just wanted to cover a few of those styles and my point is that it is possible to set the state of the game, um, like the, the velocity or position of the user, by using the user's input. Um, but in a physics engine, to have the best results, what you'll want to do is let the physics take care of that for you. It's like driving a car. When you want to go 60 kilometers an hour, you don't just push a button to make your car go 60. Even if you have um, cruise control, that's not the way it works. It still has to accelerate. And what happens is there's an engine that applies a torque to your wheels, and the wheels have a friction on the ground that create a forward force to push your car forward. And, uh, and then that has uh, an acceleration that lasts over a certain amount of time, and then you get to the speed that you want to go at. If you were building a car simulation though, there's probably more efficient ways to model the acceleration of a car without having to deal with torques and friction. Well, you, you might still want friction, but uh, maybe not like engine torque and things like that. That's, a, that's overdoing it. But this is what you want to do. You want to consider that the characters that you control within a game are like little machines and the controller or mouse or keyboard that you're using to control them um, is uh, a, a means of applying forces to the game and then let the physics engine take care of the movement of the characters. The next block in the game loop is the update game block. There's a lot of variation in this block, but really there's uh, a few common tasks that every update game block needs to do. First you need to do the physics update. 
which is updating the positions, velocities, accelerations, forces, and all that stuff. Um, and uh, I'm going to go into a lot more detail within this tutorial on updating the physics. But not everything in your game is going to be all physics. There's also typically other code that needs to run, like AI, pathfinding, storyline events, cutscenes, or maybe the user has completed a quest or something like that. So there's, there's other code that can run um, other than physics, and any custom code uh, can also go into the update loop. And that's it for the most part. And just to illustrate how sophisticated this can get, here is the update block from Unity. And uh, you can see that they, they have a, a fixed update, which is your physics loop. I believe it's possible to tie your own handlers in with that. Um, and then they have your uh, general code update. That's the code that you write that gets run um, that isn't necessarily physics related. And, uh, and then there's even an, a, a late update so that you can update things like the camera position. And, and Unity uses this concept of a fixed update to do their physics where the time interval between fixed updates can be relied upon. So it's always going to be the same amount of time, the same number of milliseconds approximately between physics updates. So that way you can really optimize some of your physics calculations by not having to deal with a variable delta t and you can really depend on that physics update happening as scheduled every time. Um, now, Unity has a built-in physics engine, so typically you won't need to worry about doing physics, but sometimes there are custom things that you'll, uh, you'll want to develop and that you'll want to build. Um, and, uh, and if you want to do any custom physics for whatever reason, you can build that into the fixed update. And in fact, the fixed update in Unity is in its own loop. So it will uh, update even if your, your general update um, ha hasn't been hit yet. So it's, it's, um, the, the general update um, can sometimes be delayed in order to uh, make sure that, that physics update is always happening when it should be happening. Having a fixed physics update isn't a requirement of having a physics engine, but it's a feature that you may want to consider and it does have some advantages that um, are outside of the scope of this video. One thing that I will advocate is having a separation between your physics updates and your general updates. Um, try to isolate that because if you don't, then, well, first of all, you won't be able to reuse any of your code because um, you know the code from a specific game will bleed into your physics updates. Um, so that, you know that could be counterproductive in the future if you ever want to reuse some of the physics code that you write. Then you're not really building a physics engine; you're just building a single uh, game. And it also produces cleaner, more modularized code, which is uh, uh, always a perk when you're trying to debug stuff. So I won't be talking too much about the type of things that you'll be putting in the general update, but I will talk a little bit more about physics update. In fact, that's kind of the focus of this series. So the, the physics update has several key parts. The first step is to apply forces, and forces can come from a number of different places. They can come from um, input from the user, they can come from the previous update in the form of you know, collision resolution, um, so forces pushing two objects away from each other. You can add, uh, you know, if the previous update determined that you had friction, you can add the friction here and, um, and apply it. Forces like buoyancy, gravity, and, and all of that stuff can also be added at this point. I'll add that not all games have to be force-based. Um, I mentioned previously that you could just set the velocity of the characters directly. Um, and, uh, and that's all fine. So you could actually skip having forces and just go right into collision detection. Um, oh, and I guess you'd have also have to do like updating the positions of the objects. So this is kind of an optional state. It depends on what you want to build, but um, yeah, a typical game engine that is um, either force or acceleration ba base will have this, uh, this step. The second stage is to update the object states, and when I when I refer to states here, I'm talking about the position and velocity of the objects. If your engine is going to use the force model to move objects, you can combine all those forces into a net force on each object, and then use that to accelerate the object over a period of time. But either way, every object is probably going to have a velocity, and you can use the velocity to update the position. So that'll happen whether or not you're using forces. Here are the two most important physics equations that you're going to need to update velocity and position. So you can update velocity, you can get the new velocity by um, adding 
the acceleration on an object um, times the amount of time that has passed since the last frame um, to its old velocity, and that will give you the new velocity. And um, since the object wasn't traveling at this new velocity the entire time, the, um, it would have been traveling the average between the new velocity and the old velocity over that time interval. So that's reflected in the second equation, which is calculating the new position by adding the old position to 0 0.5 times the, um, the new velocity plus the old velocity um, times the amount of time that goes by. So that works out to the, uh, uh, you know, V2 plus V1 over 2 is your average velocity over that time interval. Multiply it by the time interval and you have the, the change in position, position, delta D, and you add that to your old position to get your new position. Uh, easy peasy. Next up is collision detection. So go through all the objects that you just moved and find out whether they're colliding with each other. And I'm going to spend a lot of time in this series talking about how that's done. Oh, but one thing I will say, since we were just on the topic of updating position and velocity, is let's say that you had an object that was moving very fast, like a bullet. The change in position for that object might be so high uh, for a given frame that it might pass right through objects and you won't detect the collision. So uh, th there's ways that you can trace the movement of the objects so that you're not just looking at their most recent position, but you're looking at uh, the entire path of the motion and finding out if any collision took place at any point throughout the motion. And I don't think that was a topic that was in the original list of topics that I wanted to talk about for this series, but if we have time, I, uh, I might do a video on that. And the final part is to resolve the collisions. So if there are any objects that are overlapping at the end of your update, you can apply forces to separate them. If an object is dragging across the ground, you can apply drag. And usually at this step, you're not setting the position or the velocities of the objects that you're trying to resolve. You're just adding forces that will resolve the collisions on the next frame. There are different strategies with how to deal with collisions and, uh, and not make your physics engine look too choppy. The last part of your game loop is going to be the graphics update. So this is where you update the display uh, so that the user can see the results of the physics update on their monitor. Computer graphics is a huge subject and I'm not going to be going into any amount of detail um, on how you can accomplish this efficiently, um, but there really is a lot that I could say about this topic. That being said, even if you're building your own physics engine, the graphics engine will probably still be taken care of using a framework. I can't speak for everyone, but while I can understand why you might want to build your own physics engine, in this day and age, you probably don't need to build your own graphics engine. But either way, that's a topic for another series. But what I will say about graphics is that when you're doing your graphics update, this is the least important part of your game loop. So let's say that you had a lot of collisions you needed to resolve all at once and your game is running really slowly um, and it's, it's come time to do your graphics update. Well, graphics typically take a little bit of time to render as well. So what you can do is if you're running behind and your, uh, your physics update has been taking too long, um, one way that you can speed the game up a little bit and uh, catch up is to skip a frame. So, for instance, here's a quick and dirty and naive implementation of a game loop that I wrote um, basically in five minutes for this video and um, just to illustrate uh, some of the concepts here. So, uh, this is written in C-sharp. What it does is, it, uh, the first thing um, within the loop, it uh, calculates how much time has gone by and it calculates this variable called time error. So like each iteration, you take the amount of time that has gone by minus the desired frame speed. And ideally that should be zero, but because the operations of uh, physics update and um, updating the graphics typically will take a little bit longer, they're not instant, it's possible that the amount of time that will be spent in a specific iteration uh, might exceed the desired um, frame period. So that error is cumulative. So if you're uh, if you're behind on several frames, then uh, that time error will build up, and then eventually on the line 23, if the time error exceeds a certain value, then you'll skip the graphics update. 
um, and you can do that up to two times in a row to correct the error and if that still doesn't correct the error then uh, you'll, you'll still want to render the graphics even though you're running behind because you don't want uh, the game to appear as though it has crashed. One of the reasons that this is naive, by the way, is because it assumes that this type of slowdown is going to be resolved within a few frames, which might be true if skipping the graphics update resolves the issue, but it's not necessarily true. Um, and there's no upper limit here to time error, and uh, in reality, you might want to actually set up an upper limit so that, um, let's say that you had this part of your game where it was just, like running really slowly, um, and, uh, and then it was like running like that for like a minute and then time error is like is like infinity um, and then all of a sudden everything clears up and the game goes fast again like all of a sudden you're gonna get like really fast physics updates and graphics updates that might exceed your desired frame rate um, for a very long period of time that might sound good but in reality it'll make your game look really choppy and having a consistent number of updates each second is preferable there are so many other optimizations that you can add here um, you could take out the physics update and put it in its own loop so that it's running in its own thread instead of using fixed updates for physics you could use variable updates so that if the game slows down you just slow down the physics update it all depends on what you're building. Um, sometimes uh, having a consistent physics update is really important. Other times it's more important to make your game look graphically rich and physics take a backseat to the, uh, the graphical experience. And this is really one of the advantages of building your own engine is that you have the choice to prioritize whatever you want to prioritize and add whatever optimizations you want to add for your own application. In some games, you might not need any physics at all, but you're adding them for graphical purposes. Uh, like consider StarCraft or, or StarCraft 2. It, it does have a little bit of physics, but most of the physics are being used to enhance the graphical experience. And the physics aren't that important for the actual gameplay. I mean, they have a different set of physics, like collision detection, and uh, they have units that bounce off each other and splash damage and stuff like that. And yeah, that's all, that's all important for the gameplay, but they also have things like ships blowing up and, and crashing and they have debris that fly out and things like that. And all of that is um, just graphical physics. And in fact, a lot of that physics probably happens on your GPU, so it's not even running in the same game loop at all. So that's all I want to say about the game loop. If you have any questions, drop them in the comments. And hey, we made it through our second video. In the next video, I'm going to be talking about how to do basic collision detection, so stay tuned for that. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.